Um, when I first met Renee on the phone, she said to me, she shared with me that she just felt helpless um, and, uh, and, and was looking for ways that we can all be helpful. But we'll spend about five minutes. Uh, Renee will tell us a little bit about her background. She's not only a researcher um, by, by trade, uh, working with academia, but she's also an industry. And for all of us, that'll be interesting to understand the difference, especially as a lot of us are engineers. Um, then Renee and I will chat for 20 to 25 minutes. Um, covering roughly with the help of your questions. Thank you very much, students. Uh, why should we be concerned? What could help or hurt as we deal with this outbreak? Fact or fi fiction? Who has a plan that we should follow? And how can we be helpful? Um, so it'll be interesting to talk about that. And then we'll have 30 minutes to get questions from you all um, that you can raise your hand or you can submit a question. And with that, I am going to go ahead and share the screen one more time uh, to remind you that we're going to spend about half an hour. It's about 645 right now, but we'll spend um, a good half an hour talking about Renee's background and with us talking about the following questions. So let me get out of this share. And Renee, I'll go ahead and, and let you go ahead. And while you're doing that, you'll notice me scrolling around and looking uh, at the different questions that people have. Great. Can everyone see my screen with COVID-19 at the top? I'm guessing yes, unless anybody <laughs> interjects that they can't. Uh, yeah, so I just put it on the top that I titled it Learning from a Pandemic During a Pandemic, um, just to kind of be upfront with the fact that Things are moving very quickly from the week ago when I started talking to Vicki, it has much has changed in that time period. So a part of my conversation, part of what I'm going to try to convey is just the ability to adapt very quickly to information coming in, trying to synthesize it quickly and yeah, just being able to roll with the punches as things come along. Uh, and then, so who am I? Uh, I was already given a brief background, but a little bit more would be that my PhD is in population health and I got it at Northeastern University. Um, population health is a combination of biostats and epi, um, but across a bunch of different fields. Um, while I was doing my PhD, I did a fellowship at MIT. I also wanted to call out that I did, was a fellow at UC Berkeley for a few months, which was a privilege. Uh, I was a fellow at the J. Craig Venter Institute, which is a microbi microbiome institute down in La Jolla. And then also wanted to call out that I did briefly co-found a startup that was incubated in the Harvard iLab. Um, so I have a little bit of entrepreneurial experience. I'm not sure if it will be something I'll be able to share with you guys, but I'm in that mindset sometimes. Um, after that, I did a postdoctoral, I was doing a postdoctoral research at Harvard G.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, and then following that, I became the head of data science at a biotech company called Fit Biomics, and I'm still an advisor for that company, and then moved out to the Bay Area just to work as the head of research for a company called Flux. Um, and so that's what I'm doing right now. So the next slide is just to kind of help, uh, I think, a lot in patterns. So I just wanted to help to uh, distinguish kind of the different ways that I have operated in my um, career. So the two ways that I separated, it was academia and industry. Those two can blend together, but they kind of have different ways that they generally behave. Uh, so my time when I was in academia and what I've been do, still do research for with, I'm, with my academic work is that I do population level me, uh, modeling. And it's specific because a lot of it is one directional, meaning that you collect a lot of information on individuals and then you're doing statistical modeling from the population level. It's generally retrospective, meaning that we're looking at stuff that already happened. It's observational research that we're looking at in hindsight. Uh, I mentioned the fact of the guardrails because we tend to be doing incremental advancements and really heavily rely on previous research, which can be both good and bad, but it gives you a good sense of if you're going in the right direction and you have a lot to kind of build off of. Uh, and then I have 100 as meaning that it really strives for 100% perfectionism. Um, if you're building something that's supposed to be like something that is going to be considered the truth, you really are heavily screened and pushed back on for your biases and all of those other things, um, which has pros and cons, but it definitely is an important training uh, that I bring to everything else that I do. Uh, but as a consequence of all those things, it can be quite slow um, to do a proper 
population study can take years sometimes. Um, and so I'm giving that perspective because a lot of the research that goes into COVID research right now is being done on a very fast clip. So it's kind of groundbreaking for population and epidemiologists to be doing the research so quickly and you just have to be very different. And it's much more similar to my research in industry because my research in industry has a lot of differences from my time in academia. Uh, you work with both individual level and population level data simultaneously and there's a feedback between the two. So that's why I had this notion of bi-directionality. You are getting information from individuals, you're looking at them from a population, but then you're making adjustments to the product and those are kind of feeding back together and it's all happening very rapidly. And you have a lot, and I say it's the wild west because you have a lot less to draw from for research. It's very much what you're doing is kind of uncharted territories and that can be scary and exciting at the same time. And I have the 80-20 just to kind of designate the fact that it requires a level of efficiency and the information is much more instantaneous and it's a lot more translational because you're doing it so quickly and so rapidly. So a lot of the COVID stuff is happening in that sort of a way in which there is a feedback that's happening between individuals and the research. And so it has a lot of the similarities to the industry side of my things while also being drawn a lot from the actual, you know, more uh, academic training I've had in epidemiology and biostatistics. Uh, and then I think we're jumping into some of the questions that you guys very, oh, I can stop sharing so you can see our faces a little bit more. Uh, I'm actually gonna call on someone. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, the, first, the first thing we wanna talk about is why should we be so concerned about this virus? And one of the students submitted a question that I just thought was fantastic. Uh, it's sometimes the simplest questions that are the best, and it's what are the actual health risks posed by COVID-19 to students of our age? Yeah, and so that's an excellent question. There's a lot to be unpacked with that question, even though it seems quite simple. Um, and so there is the concept of individual risk, and then there's the concept of population risk. And those two kind of have come together with this particular disease, um, because as an individual, a lot of the population has quite low risk for fatality, which is an important full sentence to say, um, because fatality being the outcome that we're discussing. So you have a low risk of actually dying from this particular disease. But in terms of the population level risk, there's a quite large population level risk. And that's because if you think about an age group having a much higher group, uh, risk of dying, and then understanding the fact that all of the individuals are transmitting, can potentially transmit the disease amongst each other, which is the case for COVID, it means that we have to start to spread that risk out so that everyone in the population is taking it seriously and considering the fact that you could potentially harm somebody else through your behaviors, through your individual behaviors could harm other people in the population. So it has perhaps a low individual of a risk for most of the age groups that are below, I think around like 30 or so, it's actually about 0.2%, which is gonna absolutely seem quite low. And then when we think about it, a lot of the, the figures we've heard probably in the news, and they, they change a lot because, um, so the case fatality rate, which is what people sometimes been citing as 2%, that can change over time. It changes per population. It is not a certain thing. It is based upon the evidence we have so far. But even if we have that, that's what's spread out across the whole population, which can amount to being a lot of fatalities if you think about really, really big countries such as America, which is over 300 million people. So you really have to consider not just the individual level risk, but the population level risk and take that in mind when you're doing your individual level behaviors, which is why we're doing a lot of the things like social distancing. So that was a long answer, but I think all those parts are kind of important so you, later. You said had a, an interesting question, and that is, are we overreacting? Are we doing too much now, or are we doing too little? Um, in terms of right now, we're all under, um, uh, Shelter my brother place. uses this word lockdown, uh, but we're all kind of under lockdown. Yeah, so um, we're the Bay Area did the shelter in place yesterday. Um, I know that it doesn't... It's not the most fun thing, that's for sure. Um, but I, I think it is appropriate. I think that how things have progressed and how quickly they've progressed is just the characteristics of COVID. It grows at an exponential rate or it passes along at an exponential rate. 
And unfortunately, the U.S. was behind the game in getting prepared for this by not having testing ready, by not doing proper surveillance of people to make sure that we understood how it was spreading. So at this point, it is pretty chaotic and out of control. And we don't have a really good grasp of how many people actually have this disease and where the pockets are that are the most dense. We just don't have that information. And so everyone's at a very high risk as a result because there's so many unknowns. So the shelter and stay um, is done to try to just kind of tamp that down and to make it so that we can start to better surveil the um, population and get better monitoring in place. Um, and it's, and I can show some, let me see if I can pull up a graph that would help to actually, what I'll do is. Well, while you're yeah. pulling that up, Renee, I oh, just yeah. want to um, do one caveat. So Renee is a doctor and she studies um, population health. Um, she doesn't necessarily, is not an expert on what the virus looks like, but how it spreads, if that is yeah. okay to, to say, just to give you kind of a caveat. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, definitely. I'm not a virologist. Um, I spent time with microbiology, so I can speak sometimes, and I will try to caveat anything I say. But um, yeah, definitely not a virologist. So when I'm speaking, it's mostly from the public health, uh, more statistical background. Um, this is a visual. I think some of you guys have probably seen. It was a, I think a Obama maybe retweeted it or something like that. So it got quite popular. Um, but it's kind of getting to the notion. Um, so when I push the simulation you will see how quickly things can spread. If there's just one person in a very short period of time, a lot of people start to get uh, this illness and this shows it over time and elapse. Um, then if you look at when you do some of these more like lockdown, shelter in place, kind of these measures that are trying to reduce social contact, you can see that it happens much more slowly. And so I think that, I think it was the Washington Post that made this, it's a really good visual for understanding why we reacted the way we are, even though it might seem severe, it might seem intense, there is really good evidence for why they do it. It slows the transmission, it gives you an opportunity to do testing as smart and efficiently. So in my opinion, and I think of many of most everyone in the population in public health sphere, um, it's actually an appropriate reaction. And it's pretty impressive that we live in a place that has had the courage to do that kind of reaction. So um, and, uh, I'm building off of a, a question that another student had, but in Italy, they also imposed the lockdown. If, if you look at it, um, are we, did we do it maybe a week, a week ahead of Italy or, uh, in terms of if you look at apples to apples, the timing for everything, or are, are we a little bit later? Um, so you can make the comparisons to other countries. And I think I... Uh... I think we would, we would like to not be on the same trajectory as Italy uh, is one thing to stay. I, I'm sure people have seen a lot of the reports out of there and they're in bad shape and they're having really high fatalities, um, partly because the region that it was struck in is a little bit, um, has a higher demographic of elderly um, population. But nonetheless, I don't think that our goal is to replicate Italy. I think our goal would be to have it be much less. Um, but in terms of when to instill the shelter in place um, or lockdown, which is actually a little bit more severe than shelter in place, just as like a small distinction. Um, there's been a lot of research about when to do it because there's a lot of factors that go into that. And there's this really amazing paper, which I can share with everyone and I can go into more detail throughout this presentation because it was just released yesterday. Um, but it kind of goes through all the different simulations of when you put these kind of measures, which are like, called non-pharmaceutical interventions because they are, we're doing intervention for a disease that is based upon human behavior. Uh, and they go through the different models of what you put into place, when you put into place, how long you leave it like in place for three months or five months and how much compliance do you expect to have? It goes through all of those different models and it tries to understand what the best choices are. And I think it nets out with a lot of uncertainty, but certainly, Reacting soon, I think we think is the best option because you can't really go backwards and change the reaction that you had. So I think right now it's responsible to act immediately, kind of gauge yourself over a few weeks and see what's changed. And I think that's the plan that Sarah is doing right now. We won't know until afterwards. And that's yeah. part of how this works is that everything's kind of an experiment as you go. Um, 
I'm going to ask, um, Marcella has a question to ask, but I wanted to note uh, something. I just touched my face. I'm so conscious of it. I feel like I'm playing, uh, is it Andy Cohen, where, you know, you do something and you have to drink or something like that, but don't touch <laughs> your face. Um, I'm going to unmute Marcella because I think you had a question. Marcella, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Hi, I was wondering, uh, this uh, like the new virus, because like COVID, it comes from like a family of viruses. So this new one has been on in the medical scene for a, a while. I, I believe since October is when uh, actually hospitals around the world, or at least in the, the Bay Area, started stocking up and kind of taking note of this virus. So why has it taken it so long for uh -huh. the public to know? So, and, so, and I guess uh, my understanding is that it probably got introduced sometime around December, maybe late November, um, maybe a little before that, um, but that was in China specifically. And so people did not have great awareness to it until very, very early in the year. Um, and that was when there was a lot of going back and forth about whether or not the Chinese government was not sharing the information, if the, there was a whistleblower and stuff like that. So I have no knowledge. I know that there, like you spoke of, there is a family of coronaviruses. Uh, SARS um, was also a coronavirus. They tend to come from bats. They're a good reservoir for viruses. Again, this is all being spoken as not a virologist, but as somebody that's been rampantly reading about all of this stuff. Um, so I don't think that it necessarily, we had attention to it. There, this could be something that we all find out later on. But to my knowledge, I don't think we actually knew about this very specific uh, COVID-19 virus until earlier this year. But to that point, we still took a very long time and there's a ton of delay in the action. So, you know, even if it wasn't known about until January, it was still a very slow reaction. And I know that my uh, op-ed got passed around uh, to the class. That was most of what my op-ed was about was that a very strong frustration around the lack of response uh, by the United States. Um, so the point that you're making is absolutely there. I don't think I'm familiar with it coming uh, into the scientific world in October though. Um, uh, Marcella, I thank you for the question. I'm gonna go to another question if that's all right. Um, Arjun is, I don't know if you even. Hi, uh, hello, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Hi. So a quick question. Um, so based on the population model you showed us, it seems like shelter in place is a very good tactic to combat the spread. I guess my question is, are we truly say, so let's say theoretically, you don't ever go outside your house with your family. Are you truly safe from the coronavirus then? Or have you actually seen any cases where even if these people stay in their house, they got it in the house? I yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, and specifically, you speaking about um, households is really pertinent. In China, actually, I think, the, I'm pretty certain, and I don't remember the exact percent, but the, if not the major, but I think it's the major transmission was actually within the household. Um, I mentioned that briefly in my op-ed because that was a big thing that Wuhan had changed over time was that a lot of people were getting sick and then they were telling them to just stay at home and home isolate. Mm -hmm and they were getting everyone else and their family consequently sick because when you're in close proximity with people, this is a highly contagious virus, you're going to probably spread it to everyone. So that's actually why they switched to doing um, group quarantine, which was meaning that any way that was sick was, and I think sometimes you would see the videos of these kind of makeshift like hospital recovery centers where everyone that had COVID was being placed together in one space so that they couldn't infect their own family and keep the transmission line going that way, which I don't, to my knowledge, has not been really implemented outside of Wuhan or China as a concept, but it worked really well for them. And it got the, um, the R naught is the concept around um, how the, how quickly or how infectious it is. And it was able to get that below one, which means that eventually that's why we've seen China plateau and kind of go down in terms of its cases. Thank you. Um, I am hoping that you will answer a question um, live. Uh, <laughs> there are two questions here um, yeah. that I thought were kind of interesting. And now I like uh, one of the questions. Um, 
excuse me, answer, uh, my apologies, I just saw it and now I, I'm not seeing it again. Uh, but this is kind of interesting. Um, I'm traveling from Boston to Denver to stay with family. Thank you, Leo. Uh, any advice for me during the trip so that I don't bring COVID-19 home? Okay, <laughs> yeah, so the, the after I think um, home, travel is also a very um, common way for it to be transmitted. Um, that being said, I think it's going to be hard for you to know whether or not you're getting it. Um, I'm going to make the assumption that you are under 50 years old, which I could be wrong. And so apologies if I'm wrong. Uh, you probably are at that really low risk, like we spoke of before. Uh, the thing that I think I would caution more for is once you get home to attempt to isolate yourself from your family, uh, as best as you can. For, that's why they have around the, around two weeks time period. Um, and if you develop symptoms, for sure, definitely self isolate. But if you probably self isolate for around five or seven days, and you don't feel like you're develop, developing system, uh, symptoms, you might be okay. But it's more that you potentially will get it during travel. It's hard to stop. You know, wash your hands, do all the things that you can. But that's going to be it's going to be tough to for certain not get it traveling, but I think that the best thing you can probably do is try to do as best as you can to isolate once you get back home to uh, Denver or Boston, I forget directions of which place you're going to and from. Um, what, another question that I have, in the past um, we've seen pandemics like H1N1, but it was not handled in the way COVID-19 uh, is. You kind of talked about it, but can you talk one more time, remind us why COVID-19 is being handled differently? Uh, so COVID-19 is, is in the, this is, I guess, going back to when I had first had a real awareness and I had heard about COVID in pretty early January because many of my coworkers are Chinese and they have family in China and they were quite concerned about their family, rightfully so. And so I had heard of it, but I didn't really know much about it. And I think when I became aware of it was when more stats were coming out about it, epidemiological like statistics and the things that are concerning about it are that when I had spoke before about R not being about 2.5, which means that on average, each person will transfer it to 2.5 people. So that's when people talk about this growing exponentially. If you think one person and then each one of the people, those little dots, like that's why it was growing so quickly, which makes it so difficult to um, stop. And I think H1N1 is, and is, it has less R not, I'm not exactly sure what it is. And then additionally, the second thing that you can compare those two on is that this one is not an influenza uh, virus. They're different. Coronaviruses are distinct. And H1N1, and this is me speaking a little outside of my depth again because I'm not a virologist, but that I think is just a part of the influenza viral family. And so that means that while it was a big deal, there is some degree of immunity that we have because we are, our bodies are familiar with influenza or like those common flu strains of viruses. So there is a little bit more of an immunity that we had to it. So we were able to deal with it better, but coronavirus, we do not have any immunity to. So everyone in the population is at risk. Everyone has the same risk factors. Um, it makes it more difficult for those. Those two reasons are the primary ones that I'm aware of. But again, the virology part is a little outside of my depth. Um, Dr. Worth, uh, any thoughts on how recovery is going for people who've had it? Yeah, uh, long. <laughs> so that's another one of the things that uh, really blew my mind. Every time I saw new stats about COVID, I was just constantly like, this virus. And I think um, one of the WHO um, uh, employees that had gone to Wuhan had, and we quoted that in our op-ed because we thought it was just a really apt comparison called the Wayne Gretzky of viruses. It has just stamina behind it. And so the recoveries are, I think, you know, a, a large portion of people are recovering from what we can tell. But there's a ton of active cases because the recoveries can on average be 30 days. So they're about a month of recovery, assuming like, and that's on average. So some people recover quickly and some people recover more slowly, but it just means that that results in a lot of the data that's being analyzed is being conditioned on the case on cases that are not closed yet. So you don't actually know what the outcome is. So it's made everything quite complicated, but it results in recoveries being very long. And we don't know what the long-term effects are yet because we're still just dealing with like P 
people that have just recently recovered in the past like month or so. So it's so, ongoing. Rish, I've asked this question, um, how long it might last, we don't quite know. Is there any possibility that it would be a seasonal virus? Yeah, so that's a popular uh, question, and it's a really good question, one that I even had myself much earlier on, because we are familiar with the influenza, like the common, like the common flu that we, that we have every year. And that one, because again, this number of the R naught, which I encourage you guys, there's like a Khan Academy about it. It's pretty, that's pretty well made to understand some of these concepts since they're so pertinent right now. But that is closer to, it's a little over one, I think it's 1 1.2 or 1.3. So again, COVID is 2.5, influenza is 1.3. I say this all to say that when it gets warmer, we naturally actually just spend less time together. So the social distancing actually just happens more naturally. And since it's close, so close to one, it naturally brings it down below one so that then eventually the, uh, the like, influenza virus just eventually dissipates. Unfortunately, we don't expect that to happen for COVID-19 because it's so high that it won't be enough for us to just have the behavioral changes that come um, naturally during the summer. And I think there's some things that people have speculated on in terms of how the temperature affects it. I have not seen much more than it potentially. It's a little bit more virulent in uh, dry, cold weather, but I don't think anyone has any uh, conclusions that make us believe that it's going to go away in the summer. So in the spirit of continuous optimism, both Gustav and David ask, um, is in your opinion, um, what do you think of herd immunity and how viable is it? Yeah, so this came up a lot um, this past week because there was, in, it's a bit nuanced, but um, Great Britain had proposed something that, I don't remember if he directly called it or it had a lot of similarities to a concept that we consider to be herd immunity, which is to say, and this is what it normally, how it operates for vaccines, if you get enough of the, the population to have a vaccine, then it means that people will not be transmitting the virus. Um, this is also dependent uh, like strongly upon this concept of R naught, which I will bring up apparently a million times. But that's when you hear a lot of these projections around the concept of like either 40 to 70% of people will get the virus. And that's to say that at that point, it's kind of a point of saturation. And that's like, at that point, there's a concept of herd immunity and it's just less likely to spread around um, population and public health and probably most people in the medical profession are not advocates of that because that's still a huge percentage of the population to get it. And it's to some degree, you know, it ends up feeling quite a bit like a death sentence for people that are in that older generation that has a really high death rate and people with, that are immunocompromised who have no own immune system to be able to fight it off. So I think that's a, it's not a very good plan because it will result in a much larger percentage of deaths and that segues into this concept if, if anybody's heard anything about this flatten the curve uh, yeah. like concept that's a lot around the healthcare system so if we did herd immunity it potentially it's going to go and saturate the healthcare system and it's going to result in a lot of strain there and so we're trying to flatten the curve which is to say that you try to do social distancing these non-pharmaceutical interventions so that it just takes, it's a longer time to get us to the point, the goal that everyone's trying to get to is when vaccines are going to be a viable option, which is conservatively a year from now. Um, so that brings me to a totally different section. I've certainly heard that someone's working on a vaccine and I think I saw it on, I actually watched both Fox and CNN last night to see what different people talked about. Uh, CNN had, um, uh, the two brothers, um, the governor, the, uh, the governor of uh, New York, on with the brother, with his brother, who's a co-host, and then um, they were talking about maybe building hospitals. While Fox News was talking to somebody who said they had uh, a, a basically an antivirus, they had um, some kind of solution that might be available at the end of summer. So it was fascinating. What I'm going to do is take a quick poll of like fact versus fiction, where people are getting their information. Yeah, that's great. So I'm going to go to the poll once again. I hope you all can see it. Uh, just a moment. Actually, there's something I totally missed, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, but the source for your news. I'm curious to know where you all are getting your information, and we can talk a little bit about fact versus fiction. 
Oh, wow. So I'll share the poll in just a minute. We're about halfway through everybody answering. It's so evenly distributed. This is my stat self getting. <laughs> so we have about once 178 of you have answered. I'd, I'd love it to be over 200 because we have about 250 listening right now. It's holding. Mm. It's, it's very slow to get to the rest. Okay, so I'm just going to end this poll right now. We're at 192, close enough. Um, websites, that's where people seem to be looking um, more than, and so, tied closely with social media and then behind that newscast. Yeah. So, oh, let me share those results with everybody. I think it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so a question for you. Um, one of the questions that I have from a student is that COVID, is it possible that COVID-19 is actually originated in the U.S., which sort of explains the high death rate of last year's flu and the e-cigarette lung cancers that suddenly uh, came about? Yeah, and so I thought that was such an interesting question because uh, it's, it's a good, like, curiosity to have, like, to wonder, like, what other thing could we attribute and, like, look back and kind of do, like, a forensics on it? Um, I think, and I even asked my one friend who's a pulmonologist to like help give better clarification. And she said that the clinical presentation is different. So you would be able to tell in that regard. And then additionally, what I would know is that the, we do have surveying in terms of like you get clinical samples for the cold season to see what that um, specimen is. And so I think that the labs would have been alerted to it, but I will quickly, let me share. A screen really quickly just to show like uh, wait let me do this sorry uh, you see cool yeah so with that question I had and thank you for giving it in advance because it gives me a chance to like pull things together to talk about um, but in that vein so I don't think that those ones were attributed because there's a couple different reasons why they clinically present differently and also you can get the specimen to know but there is the concept around influ influenza-like uh, illnesses that it was called to everyone's attention that that if you look on the left side with the uh, red plots at the very end, and which is I think would have been like last week, it starts to take a jump up. And if you look on the right, this is the confirmations by the lab. It looks in terms of the lab results, it looks like we are going down in terms of influenza. So this kind of gives a little bit of a potential signal much of like what you were suggesting of, can you look for data and try to find trends to see what the, if this is here, since we know that the testing is not up to date right now. And so someone was smart enough um, to look at this and be able to notice that there does look like there's some trends. You, it's not something that's conclusive, but this is the kind of stuff that uh, any of you guys can be kind of citizen scientists and go around the inter internet and look for publicly available data. And sometimes you pull out an interesting thing and it's worth exploration. So this was one of those things. Yeah. Um, other questions on fact versus fiction. Um, so <laughs> I don't have this as a question, but people talk about gargling, how that's supposed to be helpful. Gargling with salt water. Uh, so this is, so this particular um, virus, to my knowledge, attacks the lungs. So I think that's why you see presentations of pneumonia and then subsequent different respiratory failures is that I don't think that, unfortunately, it probably helps. I think if you get sick and it's a mild illness, probably there's a, a lot of home remedies that can do. But if you have a more severe form of it, I don't think that there's probably anything more than going to the hospital and getting like treated. But there are, and to the point about the vaccines that I think you had alluded to, vaccines take a long time. It's a whole, it's a very long process. It's responsible for it to be that long. You wouldn't want them to be introduced. They could make things worse if we didn't vet them properly. Uh, but you, they are using a lot of antivirals that exist for HIV and other viruses that we have and trying to see which ones will work for uh, COVID. And some of those seem promising. And so hopefully we'll have things like that to help to patch us through until we get an uh, actual vaccine out. Uh, what did you think about um, this, this thought that there was a, a company in Germany that was being bribed by somebody in the U.S. to uh, 
Somebody? Awesome. Yeah. I can't imagine who that somebody was. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's unethical. And um, I think that kind of underscores this concept that I, I think is pretty powerful is uh, as terrible as this is, the part of the pandemic aspect is that for a rare circumstance, the whole world is unified in its attempt to take on this virus. And so to try to, you know, manipulate another government and try to take something all for yourself and to be very greedy, it really doesn't do much service to you because, I mean, I think, and that's why China is also really advocating for us to do well, because every company, oh, every country is only as strong as the, every other country is. The, the virus will go across borders. It doesn't care about borders. It doesn't care about politics. It doesn't care about race. So it's really always better for us to just like unify as much as we possibly can. And so that, that, that small silver lining is kind of cool to have that happen. Um, Cameron has been patiently waiting with his hand up or her hand up, excuse me. Cameron? Yeah, so in recent news, a lot of people have been saying that they have the virus. So like a lot of, for example, NBA players I've been saying that they're like asymptomatic, not having any symptoms and that they're recovering well. Um, so how do we know if we don't, if we do or do not have the virus and if we're simply just like passing it along? Um, yeah. Especially since we, it's not like the test is just readily available for everyone to go and get. Um, so how do you recommend that like we know if we have it or not? So yeah, you make, there's a lot of interesting points in that. And there's been much kind of pushback because NBA players, they get tests. The rest of the country is finding that it's really hard to get a test, but uh, NBA players get tests, which I'm an NBA fan, so this is not a criticism of basketball, but it's just kind of showing the fact that we obviously have inequities in this country. Uh, we can, yeah, it's not easy to get a test. And because we're younger and at lower risk, it's going to be especially unlikely that we're going to get tested. Uh, so that's why we have all these these non-pharmaceutical interventions that I keep bringing up, like the social distancing. That's why the shelter and stay is in place, is that so that we are just kind of forcing everyone to pretend like they have, or they pretend like they have the virus. Because in research right now, it's showing that potentially 30% of people that are getting the virus are asymptomatic. So that's why people speak about maybe it's the younger generations that are the people that are pushing the moving the virus around so much because they're not showing symptoms. It's, it's one of the many complications of COVID is that if you're not showing symptoms, if you had something like Ebola, which was a very big deal, you were symptomatic very quickly and you had very severe symptoms really quickly. So while the mortality rate was really, really high, it was very, it was much easier to control because you knew the person was sick and you could get them quarantined immediately. But with so many people that are showing asymptomatic, it means that we all have to take it really seriously and kind of really keep our mindset around, well, what if I did have the virus? Like when I, right now, when I go outside, I do try to keep six feet away from everyone. I, I feel perfectly fine. I have no reason to believe that I have it, but just taking the caution because it would feel so terrible to think that I gave it to somebody and that they were got really, really sick from it. So people are wearing masks or one person even asked about wearing goggles. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, it's a complicated question. Uh, we have a, a mask shortage in the U.S. and the healthcare. And I, I know in that pulse, uh, there was you know maybe twenty percent of people had maybe friends that they talked to from the healthcare field. I have a lot of empty friends, and so I guess I have that that specific viewpoint that I want to make sure that they have enough masks for them. So to use masks uh, when there's a shortage and to buy them or something like that, I, I think that that is. Um, not a good idea because it puts them at really high risk and they're doing really, really important stuff for us. It does, however, you know, there is good evidence for the fact that it, uh, if you are, if you are a healthcare professional or if you are somebody that is older, it can help to prevent the spread, especially these N95 masks that maybe we all have them already from the forest fires. I actually do have a couple from that. So those do, uh, potentially, but you have to put them on correctly. So, you know, you've got to look up and make sure you're being trained on how to put them on correctly because you might just touch your face instead. So it's, it's not a, a simple, uh, answer. And mostly I think that the thing that, um, public health is always trying to caution people on is don't go buy up all the masks with your money because those are needed for the healthcare professionals who are going to be risking their lives. So I want to switch over to another, um, thank you very much for your, everybody's questions, but I want to switch over a little bit until to the plan, like what could or could not happen. 
but I want to kick off with one question uh, from anonymous attendee who shared that China is beginning clinical trials for its first coronavirus vaccine this morning. It was an article in the Daily Mail. Uh, have you heard about that? Uh, I I know that probably I, I don't I didn't hear about that one specifically. Um, so I don't know the I it makes sense. I mean, China was the first ones to sequence the uh, the virus. And so they probably have a little bit of a head start. Um, from my knowledge, I think that every country has talked about that they're going to share the vaccine once they get it completed. So I think it's not super it's, it's not much of a race other than just a race against the virus. So that's fantastic. I don't it's still probably a ways out. So I know that uh, Trump had at one point said that it's going to be quick. The H1N1 virus was, uh, vaccine was quick because it is uh, similar to other viruses we've seen before, but this one will be a longer process. So, um, What do you think is, or that you've heard from either the states or the countries, who has had the most effective plan and, and leadership in place? What has worked well? Um, unfortunately, I can imagine something like this happening again in the future. And this is an opportunity to learn what to do or what not to do. Yeah, uh, there's been so many comparisons made because uh, this is a global thing. Um, countries that have done it well have, have been Singapore. Um, they've just kept their, their case rates really low by having a lot of surveillance. We don't necessarily have the ability to compare ourselves to countries that are very different. So in terms of the United States, um, I think that Mayor Breed's done a good job with this shelter and stay. It's kind of shown people what's necessary and is helping to ensure that we're all being educated and making good decisions. Um, and I think that, so, and I, I try not to be biased on this. I'm from Ohio originally. Uh, so I follow them a little bit more closely, but I think that Governor DeWine uh, is actually really taking a strong lead. Uh, Ohio had very few confirmed cases and he made really strong action off of, I think like, you know, maybe less than 20 confirmed cases and was following the projections of the data and not the, the case counts because we know that the testing is not being done to scale. So he was really fantastic. And I think listening to a lot of really intelligent experts who were speaking about the projections of how many cases they expected to be in the state. And he made actions off of that, which I think I have not seen many people do. And I think that that's the exact kind of foresight that we need. We can't be reactive, we have to be proactive. So I was pretty impressed by that. Um, uh, Advit has uh, a question on protection. So we talk about washing hands, keeping hands away from your face. Um, uh, I imagine most of us have super dry hands from using the uh, disinfectant all the time, um, but soap and water is really good, I think. Is yep. there anything else that you think is not helpful that people are recommending that we do? Um, other than you mentioned uh, wearing masks. Um, so I think unhelpful. That's a great, great, a great question. And I'm sure that there is something that later today I'll be like, oh, that was what I should have said. Uh, I think that maybe people emphasizing the washing hands too much is actually a little bit unhelpful. That is important. So I'm not at all saying don't wash your hands, but, uh, that the social distancing is as if not more important than washing your hands. And so that's why we speak about these six feet away from each other and why we have all these measures in place. It's transferring through aerosol droplets. So you can still transmit the virus even with that, with having washed your hands and being really good hygiene wise. It's not, people that are getting the virus are not, you know, people that are bad at washing their hands. There's a lot of different ways. It's a, it's a very contagious um, virus. So I think really emphasizing that it's the social distancing that's really important uh, is important. So don't, when people say, wash your hands and then nothing else. Sometimes I want to like add on like and social distance. So like that's, I think, uh, really important to have those two paired together more. Um, as you talked about the plan, um, we talked about feeling helpless. Um, I actually want to do a poll of yet another poll um, of the attendees. We have about 250 still on. Um, and I am just curious how everybody is feeling right now. Um, I did this with my kids. I made us just talk about our feelings. Um, and uh, I think it's important to acknowledge how we may or may not be feeling. Um, here's a question. So just to get a feel for how everybody is doing, how are you feeling about things right now? Uh, anxious, nervous about getting home, relieved to be home, hopeful, irritated, not sure, or other? Can they answer? Can they uh, click on more than one or is it just pick one? This you can pick on more than one. 
Oh, cool. Okay. That's great. Well, supposedly if I set it up. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, that's awesome. Cause I imagine that there's a confluence. <laughs> um, so I'm also going to ask if anybody wants to talk, feel free to raise your hand. Oops. Somebody's hand is raised. Matthew Dodd. I'm going to allow you to talk, but you don't have to talk about your feelings if you don't want to. Let's see if I can get, uh, Matthew, you want to add anything? I think he's still muted maybe or has a there we go. hi yeah um i was just wondering um as far as like clinical trials go and like trials for the vaccine i heard that the biggest problem with finding a vaccine isn't the actual making the vaccine itself but that's pretty simple but it's making trials and making sure that you test it properly that once it's rolled out it doesn't end up being more harmful than the good yeah it does. yeah no um, that's exactly right no, oh, sorry. Was that was, if you had something more to say? Did you have more something more to say? Yeah, and like, just do you, how do you see us maybe maybe altering regulations around vaccines about how quickly they can come out because of how widespread the world shutdown is and what your opinion on those are? Yeah, so that's I mean, it's a really interesting question. Um, and as somebody that has never had to go through the, I, I have only enough familiarity with going through the different phases of clinical trials to know that that wasn't the direction I did academia in because it's a very long, long process. Um, so I'm not familiar with what could be done to shortcut that. I, I assume that each one of those are really important and that's why they're there. I, I can't imagine that they would have them otherwise. And I think that's why they speak about it and they shortcut it as much as they can. I think that's why they speak about it. Oh, hopefully it will just be a year because I think in a normal circumstance, these sorts of trials can go on for years and years. Many people that I know there are in biotech companies and pharma companies, like, you know, you don't, you start doing research on something, you don't see it realized into the world for a long time. So I would imagine that there is not a great way to expedite that, but it's a really great question. I probably will look into it after this because I don't, I don't know enough to be for sure of why. Um, I just wanted to say, not surprisingly, and I'm surprised it's only like 56% of the responses to feel anxious. Um, I think it's important to be comfortable with, yeah, I think we're all anxious. I'd like to say I'm not anxious, but I think it's important to be true to your feelings. Um, Renee, I don't know if you'd be willing to share any of your feelings. Yeah, so I feel anxious. I feel anxious every day. Um, and I have, uh, so I, yeah, I, I maybe sort of alluded to, um, I was kind of clued into this or I became more aware of this uh, in early February. That's when I really started paying attention to the numbers and getting concerned. Um, and so pretty much since then, I have had been feeling anxious every day and it changes and so some some of the benefit i have now is being able to speak to people like you and feel as though like maybe be my me educating other people and learning more myself i can sometimes help myself feel less helpless and less anxious because we can all share in our shared experience for this and we can all feel as though there's more that we can do about it but as you know as somebody that's been dealing with this for a little while anxious is is very on point and it's hard to deal with. Um, somebody had an interesting point. Um, oops, I almost totally removed somebody by accident. Um, somebody had an interesting point about being irritated. Uh, I guess I put that in there because I have a husband who's going around kind of irritated, which is irritating me. Um, but, uh, the specific question was, why are people irritated? Is it because of the hate speech, racism, xenophobia happening these days or for some other reason? And Andrew, I know that you had your hand raised. I, I don't know if you want to talk about this or not, but, uh, I think it's an interesting question. Let me unmute you. Andrew? Wang? Yeah. Um, I, my, actually, my question was about something else. Um, all right, okay. then can we, can we save it for a minute? Yeah, for sure. Um, so hold on, Andrew. Uh, did anybody uh, want to raise their hand and talk a little bit about, uh, I, I think it's a real thing. I think it's important to talk about. Um, I, I told Renee, it really, really bothered me when I heard our, the U.S. president talk about the Chinese virus. I think that's BS. Not that I feel that strongly about it. Um, I do. I'm being uh, a little bit flippant. Um, it is a worldwide issue. Um, what I am scared of most is finger pointing that starts to happen. 
um, my daughter came home from school and she's, you know, says someone gave me a cold. Well, we're all responsible for our own health. Um, uh, obviously, I'm getting a little heated about this, but does anybody have any, um, did anybody want to add anything on that? Or Renee, do you want to add anything? No, I mean, I agree with the fact that it is entirely inappropriate and it's not even a valid thing to call it the China virus uh, because it is in less control here. We're all dealing with it's a pandemic. It's called a pandemic because it is all around the world. And to try to scapegoat it into somebody else, that's not going to be helpful. This is what we're dealing with right now. And so trying to finger point that it's this person or it's because of this, this and this, like we will do that retrospectively for sure, like probably to a better degree and actually try to understand things more. But right now it's a lot more around how can we all work together to make this something that's livable, something that we can get through as a global humanity, which is difficult. But, you know, I think that I'm optimistic that we can do it. Um, thank you. That uh, I, I'm, it's amazing how incredible people positively people also react. Um, Andrea, I'm going to unmute you and uh, see if you want to ask your question. Um, so, um, yeah, so kind of going along like uh, prevention and like what we could do in the future. Um, so from my understanding, um, scientists believe that uh, the virus came from like open markets in Wuhan, Wuhan and um, uh, it was from like eating uh, wild animals, I guess. Um, that's like their best guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just like wondering, like talking about how we could like prevent that in the future and um, like steps the U.S. could take because I know a lot of other countries like stockpile and I know a lot of um, like American drugs are produced um, in China and we don't have like our own production lines for um, yeah. essential drugs. So um, like, what can we do in the future to um, better prepare ourselves? That was, a, that's a great question. And it's a, it's a thing that we're gonna have to figure out because I think this has brought an awareness to a lot of these shortcomings that you spoke of. Um, for, to me, yeah, one of the earliest things that I became aware of and one of the things I, I told people I knew when I became more aware of like this being a big deal was the fact that China is one of our main producers of, uh, our pharmaceuticals. And so we, we maybe need to have more um, redundancies in these sorts of things. I don't say this from like a just America, but maybe just as like a global economy, we shouldn't have any place that we're necessarily to just having everything occur there. Um, and then the open market aspect, I, you know, they closed down the open market right away. But uh, at this point, I think there was, there was already a lot of knowledge that this is a problem for how the coronavirus can jump species and become, um, infect people. So I have a feeling that China's going to have to change that because having caused this pandemic that we're in right now and having that be kind of the root of that, I, I can't imagine that they're going to be able to continue to have that practice. It's something that I think of most scientists in virology they've seen it coming. It's when they're the people that are like, you know, right now, like, yeah, we've been warning about this for a long time. That was, a, it's a dangerous practice. Not to say that there isn't other ways that viruses could stem and we shouldn't just be prepared in general and have the stockpiles and have better protocols around surveillance and all of the things that we should have just, a, we should have the pandemic force making sure that we always have that in place. But I think that you bring up a lot of good points around things like shortages that we would, that we are going to be facing soon. Um, this might be a good segue. Okay. It's about 7.39 right now. And if we take about four minutes uh, or five minutes, I was hoping that we could talk about what could be helpful. And Andrew's um, question kind of teased that up. You're working at Flux. And I'm wondering, um, and we're, we're you know, about innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, taking opportunities and trying to find something positive going forward. Do you have any thoughts? And is there anything that's happening at Flux? And do you have any challenge for our students? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, and that is exactly why I'm so, ex I was really excited to talk to you guys in particular because learning that this is an entrepreneur innovation group means that I hope that some of the things I said today gave you the information that you're gonna go and explore and learn more. And I really prompt everyone to try to be as innovative as possible. Um, but to address the first part of that, yes, my company that I'm working for 
uh, we are taking this very seriously and we are going to just change, we're changing as much as we can. Uh, we're assuming this is not, I think there's been a lot of people that are like, well, this is going to be a week. We're just saying like, okay, how do we adapt? And I mean, our company is called Flux. So we kind of pride ourselves on the back ability that we can adapt and change rapidly. Uh, but we're going to start making like a lot of changes. We have a disseminated team. So we're planning on being work remote for the indefinite future. We are trying to change some of the ways that we're positioning our company to accommodate that for the um, different businesses that we work for. So we have taken it, like all of our conversations since uh, the past like week and a half have been all about how do we deal with this? And I think it was, it's a really great way of looking at it. Not so much of a like, oh, this is such a problem. This is such a problem. It's a, how do we find solutions for this? Um, and in that mindset, I made a slide that kind of more me trying to get drive this home as the concept. And so I said pandemics necessitate innovation. And I believe that to be true. It's not great. You wouldn't select into having this be the case, but it is a natural pressure that it's putting on people. And so that is kind of a call to action. Like, what are we going to do about it? So I had the no, do not exploit. I don't know if you guys all the story about this man who was stockpiling hand sanitizer and then gouging the prices on Amazon and Amazon took him off and he was kind of upset about it. Like, that person is a jerk and like, I don't encourage anybody to behave that way. You may not know this, but he actually donated everything. Did he? Oh, that's, I, I, that's I, well, I don't know. I read that in media today. I, I don't know if it absolves him for the initial action, but that's good to know. I think it was otherwise going away. So it's glad to hear that. Um, but on the other side, on the side that I think is the part that I implore you guys to do is what you guys have been, what you guys are training to do, what you guys are all very smart and you have great backgrounds is to try to look for the problems, gaps, and try to find some solutions. So the things that we're going to be facing, this is just a, a short list, but like you guys have already had questions. That's very clear that you guys have very curious and like clever minds and you are going to come up with a million other things, but you know, we have to work on our surveillance systems. I think we can look sort of to other countries like Singapore and stuff like that have developed good ones. There's privacy issues with that, but like never see things as dead ends, trying to constantly try to think like, how would I make this work? How would I make this work? I think that's the way to approach all this. How do we make testing improved? There's a million ways to do that. Uh, some of the things around social distancing, because that's one of the things that everyone's feeling is trying to figure out how to improve remote work, virtual travel. And like, there's just so many things that you can see as a negative, but if you're an innovator and entrepreneur, I really implore you guys to think of it as a positive. Uh, and that's you know really the message that I would like to convey is that this is a big deal. It's difficult. Everyone, a, min, a large portion of you guys are experiencing anxiety and maybe are upset about being inside. Uh, I find that I've been, I've never been busier since this has happened. I've constantly been working on things and trying to figure out how I can help people. And that has stopped me from feeling helpless. And I think it's something that if you fast forward in the future and you work on any of the ways in which you can make this into something innovative, I think you will always feel good about yourself because you're really helping others during a time in which it's all about how do we solve these problems? How do we showcase how innovative America is as a country? I think this is a, a really great opportunity not one again that I would select us into, but if it's the reality, let's try to figure out how we can come up with really cool ideas for how to get around. Is this something, Renee, that if people do have ideas, uh, is there something that Flux might be interested in? Should they get in touch with you? Yeah, so for, so for Flux, we are doing internal resourcing. So that means that if, I mean, people are more than welcome to get in touch. Like, A, if anybody's interested in any of these things, I'm the kind of person that like, I'm always trying to connect people. So you can feel free to reach out at the very least. I'll brainstorm stuff with you. I'm always, I'm infinitely curious. And so like, I love hearing people's ideas. I'm constantly doing that right now with all the friends I have saying things that are totally far fetched. So like, don't fear that totally just, you know, feel free to reach out to me and we can discuss ways in which you could contribute because I think that's important just to spitball sometimes. Uh, but yeah, so we are trying to figure out how to do better at understanding who a human is when you are quantitizing a person. And so we're trying to really streamline that so that if people are going to be working apart from each other, they can feel as humanly connected as possible and they can understand each other through having a better ability to quantitize uh, what a human means in terms of like their experiences and their qualities and stuff like that. Um, so if people are interested in that, you can reach out, but 
I don't want to restrict it to just be the things that I know about because I'm happy to engage people about anything that they're interested in. Also, and I will never advocate for this normally, but Twitter actually has a lot of, has good spaces for learning more about some of this stuff along this line. So like, if you're ambitious, like I have spent more time on Twitter than I've ever spent in my life because you can kind of get an idea of what people are working on. And it's like, it's, there's, if you find the good parts and you ignore certain handles that are terrible, like you can get some good ideas and spitball a little bit, so. Um, Renee, I'm conscious also that uh, we have what we do at the end of our Newton series, and, and I really am trying to keep this talk, this webinar as close to our normal series as possible, even though it's a little bit of a different format. Mm -hmm. I've been thrilled with how involved people are. We still have about 40 questions, but as we have those questions up and maybe we go through those, I'm going to put up an attendance link um, because we ask students to give their feedback. So I will go ahead and do that. One apology, if in that attendance link it talks about, and I don't know if it does or not, uh, Brian and Marilee, just know that uh, the feedback is for Renee, for Dr. Worth uh, today. And um, we will go ahead and, and if you're okay, Dr. Worth will share some of your slides that you have. Um, but if I can pull up on the screen, I'll share. Oh the yeah, sorry, that's my, I'm getting this, aren't I? No, that's all right. Yeah, there you go. And I'm going to try to share the screen and then we're just going to keep on plowing through the questions. I don't know if you can see the Q&A. Uh, if you want to start, you're welcome to. Um, Let me see. Uh, uh, yeah, so what are possible after effects from corona like lung fibrosis? Yeah, I think that's all being studied in the moment. Like I said before, um, recovery is really long. So we're in the early phases of being able to study uh, the after effects, but some people have posited that it's going to have similar after effects to SARS, which I think has a lot of uh, respiratory potential um, after effects. So I don't think it's known to my knowledge yet, but that's also something to keep in mind when I spoke earlier about what um, the risks are, is that potentially even if you don't have, if you have a moderate or something like that, you could potentially still have uh, health after effects. Um, is reinfection a problem that we should be concerned about? Right now, there's no evidence that there's reinfection. There has been a few articles that I've seen circulating about in China, somebody was better and they were not better anymore. I think that the general consensus is that that is actually an issue of testing. So testing is imperfect. You get a test and it has things around sensitivity and specificity, which are getting at how well is it at finding like the true positive and how well is it is not as getting the right thing. Um, I mean, not getting the wrong thing. And so those are, I don't, they don't actually report them for the testing, which I think is not ideal, uh, but my inside source says they're quite low. And so they have to do multiple testing to try to confirm it as being definitely um, like actually negative. And so they think those people were just, you know, maybe weren't tested enough or, you know, because of those flaws in the testing system, they got through. But I think right now the good news that is that it seems as though we expect for there to be um, immunity after you've been uh, infected one time. Do we have risk stratification numbers for various ages? Yeah, can you read this out loud? I don't oh. even understand this. this. Gary, it is a very educated. Yeah, no, it's a great question. This is a very, uh, this is a very population health question. So this is right up my alley. Do we have risk stratification numbers for various, uh, oh no, it moved. Uh, oh, sorry. For uh, various age and, and without comorbidities, are we still working uh, through that data? Such a good question, because I actually am wondering the same thing. I've seen only, um, I've only seen things based upon counts that are for the ages, and then I've only seen them as things for comorbidities separately. And so for those, the ages, as you'd expect, it's a much a higher um, mortality, which I think you're, I'm guessing you're asking about risk in terms of mortality. It has a much higher uh, mortality fatality risk uh, for the older age groups. And then comorbidities, I think it's that hypertension and cardiovascular cardiovascular disease and diabetes are the top three uh, comorbidities. And that's for everyone's, because I also, I think that not everyone knows comorbidities is the same as uh, underlying conditions is the way that they often talk about it in um, the media and stuff like that. Uh, that's really important to acknowledge though, is that that's another big risk factor that is the way that it's mostly viewed as those separate, but you could have both of them. So if you're old and you have a comorbidity, that will make you at a higher risk, but I've not seen any studies that have shown the interaction of the two. So 
Gary, great question. I'm also hoping that that data comes out where it starts to talk about how those kind of uh, interact with each other. Uh, does the WHO have their own testing kit? I don't think the WHO has its own testing kit, but that's a question that I don't know enough about to answer. And then why do countries produce and develop their own? I actually, uh, I, I told uh, Renee, like the other secret when you're, you're pitching to a venture capitalist or someone and you don't know the answer, you just say you don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, and then why do countries produce and develop their own kits separately? Also a great question that I, I am assuming that is more, that's just that we all are doing things separately right now. And excellent question. Like WHO um, is great at getting standardized information and being able to make it so that we understand it. And that's where a lot of uh, the global information we have right now in case counts is coming up through the WHO. But I, you know, I'm not actually sure why they don't get more involved in how actually things are executed because that might make it a lot easier. But that's a great question. WHO is the World Health Organization. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then, Yusuf, how long will it take for COVID-19 to plateau in the U.S. given the current measures in place? Uh, okay. <laughs> that's a hard question. Uh, but let me, can you stop sharing your screen for a second? Yes. Uh, uh, so here, um, I will stop sharing. The password passcode to get in is health, H-E-A-L-T-H. -E um, Nicholas uh, said that he had an issue uh, getting into it. If you do, just let me know. But that quiz is open until the end of break for the first time. Um, so it's uh, small uh, letters, H-E-A-L-T-H. -E and now I will stop the share. I think I forced you off anyway. Okay, Thank so you. this is getting to the concepts around different measures you can take um, and the effects that they'll have. And again, there was a um, there was a paper that came out, which I can share with everyone. It's a bit technical, so totally fine if no one wants to actually read it, but it was really, really well done by, um, it was out of Imperial College London, got published either yes, last night or something. Uh, and so this is showing in the graph, it's showing the different ways in which you can approach it and the way it changes this uh, kind of now very popularized, the, the curve we're trying to flatten. Um, we, it's hard to decide exactly how long it would take um, because actually the thing that's really important to notice about this is that the red line at the bottom is not baseline. That is just the um, maximum uh, health care like, capabilities we have. So you, you can flatten the curve over time by doing the things like we're doing. Uh, I think so we're somewhere amount around like you can do. There's also a graph in that same uh, document that gets to the notion of if you compound different measures, they have a, you know, a, they have a compounding effect and they're improved. Uh, I'm saying all this to say that it's, it's a hard uh, question to have an answer to. And the real truth is that there is no plan that doesn't entail us having some form of these measures in place until we have a vaccine. It is important to notice to note that they probably won't always be in place. It will probably be for periods of time in which we will need to have certain levels of self of, of self isolation. Um, and other times where we can go back to normal, there can be different variations of school closing. There's a lot of different things that can be adapted and changed. And that's going to be something that gets more teased out over time, depending on how well we're able to get it controlled to begin with and get testing scaled up and get an idea of it. Um, but I have a hard time really being able to predict like when those would happen, that's going to be um, a lot, a lot more figured out as we start getting inf information back after we do these procedures. The first time do we find out that us doing the shelter and stay was effective and that lets us be a little bit more relaxed in the future. It's like that kind of stuff where we're going to be learning as we go. Um, but it, it's probably going to mean that we're going to have some sort of a change um, up until the vaccines uh, coming out. Oh, yeah. And there's more questions. I answered that like that was the end. Oh, there are a lot of questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So how can people reach you? Uh, oh, how can people reach me? Uh, you can, you can email me. I can share my email. You can uh, tweet at me now that I'm on Twitter for this temporary COVID time period. Um, those are probably the two most effective routes of getting a hold of me. Why don't we do um, Twitter? Why don't we recommend Twitter? And so I, I never recommend Twitter. So I'm like not a person that's like getting endorsed by Twitter by any means. Uh, I find that for this particular, and I, I, 
yeah, I had ne I've never really used it much. Uh, this one, there's a lot of academics that are on there and they will share their papers directly on Twitter. Uh, and then they will, you know, give a little brief about it and you can engage with them. And that's pretty unique. Uh, I have places that I can go and get a hold of academics, but it's generally not something that's so accessible to the public. And in my experience with COVID, uh, the, I have not found that uh, the media has always been reliable in telling the correct narrative. There's a lot of narratives that were coming out that this is just like the flu and a lot of things that are erroneous for a long time. So I've been relying much more on these alternative ways of getting information and making sure that they're vetted through sources I trust, which in my experience has been more of the academics uh, thin. Do you, uh, do you want to share your Twitter handle though? Uh, I don't, yeah, it's, it's, it's open. It's a, what it actually, P, it's PhD worth, I think, or something kind of a silly like that. Uh, and sometimes I probably rant a little bit, but most of the time I think I just tweet things that are retweeting papers and stuff like that. So uh, it's probably a little bit boring, but I think that those papers and the sentence I say before them is a reasonable synthesis of information. <laughs> um, Renee, I am hoping you'll stay on, but because we are rounding out toward eight o'clock, there's still about 37 questions, believe it or not. Um, and maybe you can type some of those, but I just wanted to give, let's see if this will work. I'm just gonna try to give you a round of applause, but let's see if I can possibly make this work with my sound effects, I'm not sure. Let's see. Can you hear that? Yes, thank you everyone for your applause that you just did. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm ready to be a DJ now. Um, thank you so, so much. We still have 192 that are on and listening. I don't know if you can take another 10 minutes to go through the uh, questions, but that would be awesome. Yeah, um, I can do another 10 minutes for sure. Okay, um, and so I'm like doing this very lightning speed, so I'm sorry if it's some people say that life will only go back to normal when 60 to 70 percent people get it. So the transmission rate, the R naught that I've been bringing up, is lower than one. Absolutely right in terms of that concept. Uh, do you think that's the case? Could there be a more optimistic outcome? Yes. The outcome that everyone currently globally is trying to do is to not have it be that, because that would be the concept around herd immunity. The 60 to 70 percent is when you have the concept of herd immunity, which means that everyone previous to, like everyone else would have potentially been exposed and that would have resulted in a lot of deaths. Uh, the estimate right now is for the US, if we did herd immunity, that potentially around 2 million people would die. So that is not what we want. We want to be able to do what I was speaking to a little bit ago about the concepts around us doing these various interventions around social distancing and trying to see what confluence of them, them work in cohesion and how we can do uh, our own lifestyle changes so that we can reduce that and save, you know, a ton of lives by doing that. So that's my more optimistic one is that we're going to be able to do this for the rest of the year because we as a country really care about saving as many lives as we possibly can. Um, okay, okay. And then am I at, oh, at uh, Lewis, how long do you think impacts in society a uh, remote university will last? Uh, it sort of builds upon that. I think some aspects of this will continue for the rest of the year. I think that innovation is going to keep up with that and we're going to find ways in which we can maybe have a uh, like tandem of sometimes remote, sometimes in person or figure out clever ways of making this work. I don't think it's going to be the way that it is right now where it feels very reactive and scary. I think that there's going to be smart people that are coming up with good solutions for it, but I do anticipate there being some sort of change to life for probably the remainder of this year. Um, we could notice that China and some other government encourages their citizens to wear masks, whereas CDC, does, what do you think mask works or not? Uh, as the blunt question, yes, they work for a few different reasons. One that they have some research around is that potentially if you are sick, you are the aerosols that you could project onto somebody else aren't going to happen if you're wearing a mask. Um, secondarily, I think that they also have some behavioral conditioning. When you're wearing a mask, you're more aware of the fact that you're, put, you're, like, you're dealing with a pandemic and you're going to maybe also have secondary behaviors like social distancing that's going to happen as a consequence. Again, I think the CDC does that because we do have a shortage of masks. Um, so 
I think that that is the primary reason. And I think it's responsible. It's, un, it's, it's that's not ideal. And that goes back to what can we change in the future? And maybe in the future, we can anticipate this better and have masks available for everyone. But in the short term, you know, the healthcare are, workers are higher priority. They're on the front line. They're kind of doing it on a day to day. So unfortunately, that's the circumstance. But uh, I think they probably do work to some degree, but we aren't using them because we need to save them for uh, people that really need them. Do you think the COVID-19 will live with us in the life, even in the future? Yeah, that's a popular, um, and it, I th I've heard that theory many times and it makes sense that potentially it will just kind of be a thing that we have a vaccine for. And it's just something that we deal with every year, the same as the flu and some people get sick, um, but we hope that we have herd immunity and that it doesn't cause nearly the number of deaths that we would have from this first time when no one has immunity to it. So that's potentially something that could be true. Uh, is it possible that the virus will mutate and become more fatal? Mutations are always an option. Um, I, this is, since I'm not a virologist, I can't speak too much to that. I know that there was a paper that came out uh, about this L and this D mutation, and one of them was more fatal, and that was in the upper. That one had uh, been pretty well debunked um, as not being uh, very good research, because I should note that a lot of the research being pr uh, put out right now is not peer reviewed, which is not ideal, but it's because we're trying to get the research out so quickly uh, so everyone can consume it. So that paper talked about mutations. It was debunked as not being an authentic mutation, um, but that is something that could happen. Uh, I think no one has seen anything about it yet, so it's not something to be super concerned about, but that's a great question because it's true. Uh, what, do you th what do you think will be the most hurtful consequences from COVID-19 and the lockdowns across the world? A I, I, fatalities or economy? Um, I think that depends on how we respond. I think if we try to be really, really thoughtful, we can probably come up with a way in which we can, I think, I mean, fatalities, I think are a top priority, um, but then we can probably find ways to do it in a way that is less detrimental to the economy. Um, I have confidence that there's going to be people that are going to think about that really well. And as you've seen in China, they've started to be able to go back to work a little bit more because they were able to get better containment and control of the virus. So there's that potential. Um, I think in my purview, which is biased as a public health person, uh, I think that the fatalities will be the thing that is the bigger uh, risk to have consequences for. So that's the thing to focus on for um, what to reduce. Uh, so then COVID-19 spreads way more quickly than SARS and MERS, although the two are more fatal, I believe. I think that is true. I don't remember the f uh, fatality for those two, but that could, that could very well be true. Um, I think it's the infectious or it's the contagiousness of COVID-19 that makes it very difficult because that means that it's, that's why we're, and I also think, uh, I know for SARS, I'm not sure for MERS, uh, SARS, the onset of symptoms is I think within a day. And since COVID has that asymptomatic quality, as well as sometimes the delay of onset for symptoms, it's again, it's much more transmittable uh, throughout the public. So it's just something that even with its, you know, somewhat seemingly low fatality risk, when you apply that to the population, it scales to be millions really quickly. Are you going to say something? Um, no, there's just a lot of questions. There are a bunch of questions that are around the vaccine. I, I think we'll kind of group them into two more larger questions, if that's yeah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you've been awesome. Uh, you're, you, uh, I just want you to know you've answered over 55 questions, um, <laughs> well over 55 questions. Um, but let's say that the, the, the testing starts to come out. Um, how do you foresee the testing will be distributed? What, what are best practices for that? Um, can you talk a little bit about when testing comes out, what that means? Yes. I, so that's one of the, part of the reason why I listed uh, that in my kind of, you know, call to action for everyone is that to my knowledge, I don't think that, I think that's part of why it's been chaotic is that a lot of the testing is being distributed based upon a relationship with a hospital system and things that are, you know, maybe work when we're dealing with things that are like, you have time and you can have contracts for, but I think if we had better systems around how do you locate where their tests being made, because they are being now made by private organizations and figure out how to best distribute them to areas that maybe are in the highest need of them or something like that. This is the kind of stuff that I think could be really beneficial for 
there to be innovation in because I don't think we've ever dealt with this specific huge demand on testing. And one thing I should note is that there's a limitation in the amount of tests that can be created based upon the reagents they need. So there is just like, this a supply and demand kind of problem. And I think, you know, there's people that are, I'm sure some of you guys even have like familiarity with how to optimize for something like that. So I think that's a space that could really benefit from having some innovation. Um, I am actually gonna leave us on that note just to be conscious of your time. Um, I think the questions will remain. I don't know if you wanna take time um, offline to go through some of these questions with answers. Um, I wanna commend, I'm, I'm always, uh, whether it's my right or not, proud of the students and the questions were incredible. Um, we will be continuing to do a webinar format for the rest of the semester. Um, we will not have a webinar next week because we all actually have a planned spring break. I always know that something nice to know something's planned. Um, and then Tracy Young will be with us um, in uh, when we come back from spring break, even though we won't physically be here, we'll be here online. I also wanted to extend something to everybody. Um, we talked at the Satarja Center about being there for students if you want to have a virtual coffee um, or a virtual tea or maybe you need a virtual glass of wine, uh, which I think could even work for an 18 year old. Uh, so please reach out to us. Um, we, our, our thoughts are with you. We wanna be as supportive as we can. Uh, Renee, it's been great to have you. Keith, I wanna thank you also for helping out and uh, stay safe. And as I said two weeks ago, wash your hands, keep your hands away from your face and um, thank you everybody for your help in, in not spreading. Renee, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, no, I appreciate you guys for hanging around and listening to me talk at you. I know it's less fun than having it be something that's a little bit more interactive, but you guys have been asking really fantastic questions. If you have more of them, I'll try to answer these ones. If you have more, you can email or um, uh, d DM me, I guess, or I, I don't know if I have that functionality, but you can tweet at me or something like that, but I'll try to come up with communication lines. Uh, and I guess I just kind of my leaving remark is that I hope that you guys work on trying to help other people. I think this is a difficult time for you guys. And one of the ways to feel better is, in my opinion, is trying to figure out what you can do. And it nothing's wrong. Just see what's ask questions and things like that. And I think that that kind of attitude is what's going to get us through. So thank you guys for listening, though. Uh, thank you very much. Take care, everyone.